The preseason Big 12 media poll is out. TCU comes in at fifth. They have Texas projected to win the conference. We'll talk about that and more next on Locked On Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. I'm your host, Stephen Simcox. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find us wherever it is you get your podcast in its audio form. Uh, the preseason media poll came out on Thursday for the Big 12. Media Days is coming up this next Wednesday and Thursday. I believe the 12th and 13th is the date on that. Um, where do the Frogs stand in the conference? Well, they're picked to finish fifth. According to the assembled media, here is a rundown of the standings or uh, the projections. Texas is picked to win the conference at one, Kansas State at two, Oklahoma at three, Texas Tech at four, TCU at five, Baylor at six, Oklahoma State at seven, UCF at eight, Kansas at nine, Iowa State at 10, BYU at 11, Houston at 12, Cincinnati at 13, and West Virginia comes in at 14. So Texas picked to win the conference and picked to win the conference pretty overwhelmingly. 41 first place votes. Somebody made a good point. So Texas has 41 first place votes. Kansas State has 14 first place votes. Oklahoma and Tech have four apiece and then TCU with three. Oklahoma State, which came in at seventh, also had one first place vote. But it seems like the general consensus is everybody has Texas as a heavy favorite and then Kansas State coming in at number two and then Oklahoma through TCU that three, four, five, um, almost interchangeable, at least from a first place vote perspective. I made some tech fans pretty angry yesterday. I went on uh, the radio with Matt Mosley and talked about how I have questions about tech. I have questions about Tyler Shook and his ability to stay healthy. Um, I have questions about Joe McGuire in year two taking the next step. I, I mentioned that I think you have to do more than just tweet out Rick Fr- Rick Flair gifts, excuse me, um, to have preseason media hype behind you and tech fans got upset. They're on Twitter calling me ugly, which in my defense, I never claimed that I was handsome. Um, But I think my take is, is a fair one. And I would have had TCU above Texas tech. Um, But I mean, like I I can't really disagree with Texas at one. I still have questions about Quinn Ewers. I think replacing B. John Robinson is going to be a much tougher task than people might be expecting, but I know they have a veteran offensive line now. And I, I believe that just on paper, Texas is going to be uh, really good. Uh, Now they haven't done it in a long time. And if someone was going to say like, listen, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have Texas as the team to beat. I would totally understand why I just get why there's so much um, excitement around that program this year, but five for TCU. I would have TCU at third. I would have them above um, Oklahoma. I would have them above Texas tech. And I know some people would have them above Kansas State. I understand Kansas State lost a lot, too. Deuce Vaughn was huge. They also lost some skill positions um, that were really important for them. But they have their own line returning. I think Chris Kleiman's a good coach. They're just one of those programs that it feels like they have a pretty high floor. Like, under Chris Kleiman, I think they're going to be sound. I don't think they're going to beat themselves. They're going to be able to win games that they should. They'll be more physical um, than some teams. And so that should translate to kind of a floor of six to eight wins. And then if they're better than that, you know, you sort of go from there. But I think TCU is being overlooked. I get why, though, from a national perspective, from people that aren't digging into the roster on a daily basis. You lose Max Duggan, you lose Quentin Johnston, um, Kendra Miller, et cetera. And the interior offensive line some shakeups on the D line. There's reasons to have questions about TCU, but I still feel like the potential that this team has um, Kendall Bryles coming in as the offense coordinator, Chandler Morris, who won the starting job last season, stepping into that starting role, being prepared, being ready. Um, The advantages they have that slot receiver position, the tight end position with Jared Wiley at tight end with guys like Jojo Earl and uh, John Paul Richardson at wide out in, in the slot really good chance that TCU is going to be good this year. And, um, you know, we've talked about this before. It is a program and a team that does seem to thrive in the underdog role. And I think between uh, getting just beat down by George in the national championship game 
and the fact that there are some people that are underestimating them or kind of sleeping in them going sleeping on them going into the season. This is going to be a team that has a lot to prove and should come in with a chip on their shoulder, which is what you always want as a head coach and as a fan, as a, as a group that's motivated. And so we'll see how it plays out. You know, my other thoughts from the preseason media poll, um, West Virginia in last place doesn't shock me. Neil Brown, I know he's on the hot seat. Uh, you never really know who's going to be there at the quarterback position for them. I feel like most people, and myself included, don't really know what to make of the new teams. Um, UCF was the only one that stayed outside of the bottom four there at eight, but you have uh, BYU at 11, Houston at 12, and Cincinnati at 13. Now, I think Cincinnati would be much higher if Luke Fickle was still there, but of course he goes to Wisconsin. Now Scott Satterfield is coming in, who is basically getting run out of town in Louisville. That seemed like a strange hire to me, even though I know Scott's had some success in the past in the ACC. But overall, that just seemed like a weird situation. Uh, BYU, I think, is the team that's most prepared to step up to the Power Five level because of their schedule in the past. But I know they're coming off a disappointing season last year. Kalani Sataki, um, not his best year as head coach. Uh, and then, you know, do you do you believe in um, in the Cougars with Keaton Slovis, their quarterback, coming over from Pitt uh, via USC originally? So this will be his third transfer in his third school that he'll be starting at. So a lot of good questions um, coming into this next season. I wonder what Oklahoma is going to do. They're a big wild card to me. I think their schedule is pretty soft and that defense can't really be worse than it was last year under Brett Venables. Um, so how much of an improvement will we see from the Sooners? What is Kansas state going to look like coming off that big 12 championship year? A lot of great questions in the Big 12. If you have questions, concerns, thoughts about the Big 12 preseason media poll, where TCU is at number five, is it fair or unfair? You can do that in the YouTube comments. You can also tweet at me at Simcox Steven. The show is at Locked On TCU. Again, that's at Locked On TCU for the show, at Simcox Steven. Uh, for my personal Twitter account, we'll take a break, come back, and we'll talk about TCU and the outside wide receivers. Where will they be? Where will Savion Williams and Dalen Wright be going into the year? We'll talk about the next on Lockdown Horn Frogs. It is FanDuel. FanDuel.com slash Lockdown FanDuel, a proud sponsor of the Lockdown Network. If you want to bet on baseball games, MLB baseball games, you can do that right now at FanDuel.com backslash Lockdown. You can also uh, use their safe, secure, and easy to use app, FanDuel. That's where the game starts, their official betting partner. Of Major League Baseball. I've talked about this before. If you listen to the show, you know it. They have a no-sweat first bet deal. You can put as little as $5 down, and if you lose on that first bet, you can get up to $1,000 in bonus bets, which you have to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to take advantage of that deal today. And again, they have that app that you can use. You can make parlays, you can do prop bets, or you can just bet on the money line if you want to keep it simple. FanDuel.com slash locked on in the FanDuel app. They are a proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. So I think I've decided as I've continued to kind of preview this team, look at what TCU football is going to be in 2023, that my biggest concern on the offensive side of the ball, aside from the O-line, where you're replacing three interior offensive linemen, um, Alan Ali, Steve Avila, and Wes Harris all moving on. They're replaced by, we think, Colton Deary at center, uh, most likely Willis Patrick at one of those guard spots, and John Lands at the other guard spot. That's going to be a huge question mark for the team this year. Can you prevent interior pressure? Can you keep Chandler Morris upright and give lanes for Trey Sanders and Amani Bailey and maybe even a guy like Connor Cook, the true freshman from Round Rock, um, space to run and make plays? But aside from that, on offense, I think the running back situation is going to work out. I'm not sure if they'll have one clear back like they did last season with Kendra Miller. And I think Tanner McKinney said this, one of our listeners at one point, he was like, maybe he was talking about quarterback, but he was like, I think quarterback's one of those positions that you figure out during the season once the game starts. I feel like that translates to running back too, because you don't have a lot of full contact practices anymore. Um, you're not bringing, you're not always bringing guys to the ground. And so once the game start and you see how guys, you know, how they're running, how they adjust to contact, how they keep their balance when they get hit. That's going to be a huge factor. I was impressed with Trey Sanders 
and his ability to be patient and find lanes to run um, in the spring game. And Imani Bailey has a lot of explosiveness that he showed last season, mainly towards the end of games. That was when he was playing. I think it's going to be different um, when he's playing in, you know, normal game-like situations where the defense is – first of all, you have your first team defense on the field. Secondly, they're probably pursuing a lot faster. They're not worn out in the fourth quarter. But I feel like that running back group has a good chance to be a nice little one-two punch. However, I am concerned about the outside wide receivers. And Savion Williams had a nice year last year. He was, you know, on the other side of Quentin Johnson. Um, I think he's a guy that can go up and get those 50-50 balls. He uses his body really well. He uses that big frame of his um, to make plays. He had some big catches last year. Had some big catches in that West Virginia game in the second half. One that comes to mind, another one had a big catch on that drive against Baylor where they went down and kicked a field goal as, as time expired. I believe that was on first th- first or second down. It was after Max Duggan connected with Tay Barber. But Savion's going to have to get separation. Um, I mean, he's not a burner necessarily. He's not a guy that's just going to run o- run right past people. And Quentin had great speed and can make things happen. But he has to get separation. He has to win one-on-one matchups. And I do wonder about him facing the other team's number one corner. Now, he could very well improve and have a great season. It could also just be a factor of getting more targets is going to help him out a lot. But I wonder about Savion. I wonder about Dalen riding the other side if he ends up being the starter. Um, because... He, as much as he showed some potential at Minnesota, had a big game against Ohio State last season, showed some flashes both at Minnesota and Texas A&M, um, he's going to be asked, you know, if he is your starting one of your starting outside wideouts, he's going to be asked to do a lot. And I am excited about your inside wide receivers. I've talked about Joe Jarrell. I've talked about John Paul Richardson. Um, I think, you know, Jared Wiley has a chance to be great, as I said in segment one. DeAndre Rogers potentially, one of those young tight ends. But I'm not sure that you can run this offense or really run many offenses with your slot receivers being your main options. Now, I know it happens at times, right? Like, I know you look at the L.A. Rams, like uh, Cooper Cup, they move him all around the field, but he mainly works in the slot, and he's fantastic. Cowboys last year, they use CeeDee Lamb in different ways, but he's probably most effective when he's in the slot and he's able to get over the middle of the field and then make things happen after the catch. So I realize that it's possible, but I believe you have to have a threat on the outside. And I think a lot of this offense that Kendall Browse runs, you don't necessarily have. Now, we'll see if it's different when he is out there with Arkansas, but you're not in a lot of four and five wide receiver sets. So receivers are going to have to win matchups. They're going to have to be able to break free, get separation, make plays. And so for a guy like Savion, who is, I would say, the first few years of his career, has been more of a possession guy, someone who you can count on to go over the middle, make plays, um, you know, use that big body, just turn around and kind of make a wall in front of the defender on some of those curl routes, go uh, outside the numbers and down the field and make big catches. He's going to have to find a way to get open, and it has to be more than just, okay, it's one-to-one, and I think he's bigger and faster and can jump higher and can go get the football. And so that I, I believe that's my biggest question mark now for this, this offense outside of the O-line is how are these outside wideouts going to win one-on-one matchups? Now, there's some – I mean, there's some – uh some X factors here too, like Cordell Russell, the true freshman, um, he can come in and make an impact. I don't know what that's going to look like since he missed most of spring ball with a broken collarbone. I'm not sure if he's going to be ready, you know, to step in day one and make plays, but hopefully as the season goes on, he'll be someone that can make things happen because I think he's a great talent. And so you have options. It's not just all the pressure is not going to be on those two guys, but I do believe that for this offense to hum at a high level and to do the things that they want to do, um, those guys have to win those matchups. And, you know, they moved Chandler around a lot in the spring game in some of those rollouts. And so that can make things easier on a wide receiver too, moving the pocket, you know, different throwing angles, different routes. Um, But 
you can't, I mean, you can scheme some things up. You can't always scheme up like we can give you a good matchup. You still got to go win that matchup, right? Like we can put you in a situation where it's one-on-one and you just got to go make a play, but you still have to make the play for it to work. So uh, I wonder about your the outside wideouts. Can they be good enough that not everything's going to be just funneled towards the middle of the field and you're not going to have a ton of pressure on your slot wide receivers and your tight ends to make big plays? Because I'm not sure if it can function as well as it should if you're asking those guys to be uh, the main ones when it comes to explosive plays, big plays down the field, and just, you know, receptions in general. When we come back, we'll discuss uh, a few of you had thoughts on um, – the all big 12 team people you thought got snubbed people you thought got left out. So we'll, we'll wrap up with some audience questions. This is locked on horn frogs. All right. Final segment here on locked on horn frogs. Um, I was asking the question yesterday who was off the preseason all big 12 team that you thought from TCU should be there. And, um, Tommy Fisher said, I think one of the young defensive ends is really going to pop this year, and we need them to do so. I think John Paul Richardson can end up leading the team in receptions and maybe yards and wind up on the big all Big 12 team. Hard to tell because a lot of guys have talent potential, but uh, only a few have shown it on offense. He thinks the defense will be really good and carry us early. Yeah, as far as those young defensive ends, you know, maybe you're talking about like Paul Wale. Um, I, I think he could be a force. I know he had a good spring camp. And so hopefully he's one player that emerges. You know, we've discussed this year who's going to be the guy that steps up and brings pressure from the outside. It's going to be one of those outside linebackers like Jonathan Bax or uh, maybe even a guy like Marcel Brooks, even though I'm not sure what a snap count is going to look like in his uh, health recovery. Or will it come from the defensive ends like it did at times with Dylan Horton last season? And, yeah, John Paul Richardson has been uh, the talk of the town as far as, like, coming in, understanding the offense, making plays, making catches. So I don't think that's off base saying he could lead the team in receptions and yards. And you're right, it is hard to tell on offense because you just don't have a lot of returning production. And that's why, um, I mean, that's why you're looking at not a lot of people on the All Big 12 team to start the year because, you know, most of it's you just look at what guys did last year and who's returning. And so that's that's what most of the media – folks are looking at when they make these decisions. Um, Bud Clark should have been higher on the list and Jack Besh should be on the list. Also, why are there so many Texas players on the list when their team can't even win 10 games? I'm sick of the respect for them. Um, Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, I think Texas is going to be really good, at least on paper, but I understand why you have questions about them. Um, Bud Clark is also someone I would have had on the list. You know, Jack Besh is an interesting name. I feel like he's another guy that could be really good for TCU. Um, he didn't practice in the spring because of injury as well. But, again, it just kind of comes back to potential rather than production, even though I know he did some good things at LSU. Uh, Zoom play said Marcel Brooks and Bud Clark. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm not sure about, you know, how much Marcel's going to play, but I think he could make a huge impact. Biff McGraw said Shadrach Banks. That's a good name. I can see Shadrach making a huge impact this year. Love his athleticism and his ability to make plays. Uh, Richard Berry says TCU's just got to win. That's the only formula. They've been disrespected since the start due to the size of the school and track record in big games. He did talk about having that one shot against Georgia um, and kind of falling on their face. And then he thinks nine plus wins will be needed to heat up recruiting um, to show that there's only a small drop off. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, I think TCU needs to have a big season. I've talked about how pivotal this year is for them and maintaining that momentum, and that's going to be huge when it comes to recruiting. Uh, Craig said the Disrespect neighborhood is where TCU lives. Been there for a long time. It's like the Big 12 being called a truck stop conference, um, and being disrespected only hurts if you let it have to embrace it. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. Uh, I think it's going to be motivation for the team. I don't feel like it's going to be something that they dwell on too much, but they use it to fuel them. And then Tanner McKinney, um, says he thinks Cam Cook will be a factor. Uh, Jamoy Hodge should be on that list, and Channing Canada will turn a lot of heads. Yeah, Jamoy Hodge is a good name, too. This linebacker room is really good, so I feel like they have the potential to be very good at that position. Um, and Channing Canada, the Juco transfer, I could see him getting in the rotation at corner. Not sure if he'll be an all-Big 12 guy, but I do feel like he can make an impact 
on this season. Uh, that'll do it for today. We'll be back next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Shows will be available next week. Thank you for listening. This is Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team every day.